It's Wednesday, February 12. This is the news on PBCJ. I am Simone Absalom. The government has put forward a budget of $852.7 billion, with $778.4 billion allocated for recurrent housekeeping expenses and $74.2 billion for capital development projects. Details of the projections are outlined in the estimates of expenditure tabled in the House of Representatives on Tuesday by Minister of Finance and Public Service, Dr. Nigel Clark. The total expenditure, Mr. Speaker, is proposed is $852.7 billion, broken down into $527.6 billion for non-debt above-the-line expenditure, of which 453.4 is recurrent and 74.2 is capital, and then debt service of $287.8 billion, of which interest is 132.7, and amortization 155.2, with non-debt below the line expenditure of $37.3 billion. Large sums have also been allocated to several other ministries by the government. The proposed public body envisages net expenditure of $441 billion, comprised of recurrent expenditure of $354.6 billion, capex of $78.9 billion, an amortization of 7.7 billion. The, on the consolidated public spectrum, Mr. Speaker, the consolidated central government and public bodies together, therefore, indicates total expenditure of 1,293.8 billion, or 1.293 trillion, which is 17 billion more than the 1.276.8 billion, oh, sorry, the 1,276.8 billion, or 1.276 trillion, for the current financial year. When the second supplementary estimate was tabled in the House on February 4, it showed that the government intends to spend $859 billion up to March 31, the end of the 2019-2020 fiscal year. Continued significant infrastructural investment and greater socio-economic programs. That's the aim of the government as the country enters a new decade. The details were highlighted by the Governor-General, His Excellency Sir Patrick Allen, in his throne speech as he formally signaled the beginning of the financial year. The state opening of Parliament on Tuesday was held under the theme Towards a Decade of Growth to anchor or peace and prosperity. Speaking to the issue of growth and prosperity, the Governor General pointed to the ongoing Greater Infrastructure Development Program, the GIDP, a multi year comprehensive infrastructure program which includes not just roads but bridges and structures, street lighting, sidewalks, and more. The GIDP is a multi year comprehensive infrastructure program which includes not just roads, but bridges and structures, street lighting, sidewalks and ramps, traffic lights, water and sewage, fire hydrants and drainage. The Governor General noted that plans are in place for the Lengthman Program, a preventative maintenance program for rural roads and high traffic corridors built on a performance-based system and enabled by technology. This program will be executed at the community level by local residents. The government's vision is to create modern, smart and sustainable urban centers. The aim is to make places that are accessible, secure, clean and connected for the enjoyment of the people and the pride of the nation. According to the Governor General, 180 rural residents are set to benefit from water mitigation measures to alleviate water resource challenges. He also disclosed that the construction of Jamaica's first multi-purpose built parliament will be built in the next fiscal year. The new Parliament building and the transformation of the National Heroes Park are part of the master plan to redevelop downtown Kingston. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says his administration will be tabling a new domestic violence bill. He was addressing a Jamaica Labour Party Area Council 2 meeting held in Portmore on Sunday. This, he says, is in response to the increased incidence of domestic killings that has been occurring across the island. Right here in Portmore, 
early this year, early January, we read of the tragic incident of a soldier who murdered his spouse. And there have been, before that and since that, several such very tragic, brutal, and savage incidences that have occurred. The government of Jamaica is now in the process of reviewing and with the view of tabling, hopefully very soon, a new domestic violence bill. We have defined being a man as being physically stronger than a woman. And that is the power relationship. That is the power dynamics. So in any form of conflict, the man will have to prove his strength over the woman by trying to physically dominate her. Now, this is not something we can tolerate. This is something that we must change in this society. There is a call for a bipartisan commission to establish and to explore tertiary education funding. The call comes from Parliamentary Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister, Senator Robert Morgan, as he made his contribution to the State of the Nation debate in the Senate last Friday. Mr. President, a bipartisan commission that borrows on broad stakeholder consultations, including students, including politicians, including teachers, including school owners, would be tasked with coming up with a unified position on the way forward for the funding of tertiary education for the next 50 years. Senator Morgan says tertiary funding needs to be re-examined as the country continues to experience a brain drain with university graduates leaving to pursue careers elsewhere. He proposed that students be given incentives to remain on the island. I was listening to the radio the other day and I heard concerns about the exit of critical care nurses from the system. There has also been concern about how many police are leaving the force every year. And there are so many other critical areas of our society where persons are either unwilling or do not wish to participate in the numbers that we as a country need. Mr. President, I am suggesting today that we give an incentive to certain critical industries in Jamaica where, for example, if you join the police force and spend five years, your student loan will be forgiven. Seventeen Jamaicans are now starting a new life in Jamaica after being deported from the United Kingdom. At news time, some were still being processed by police at a facility on Merion Road in Kingston. According to the British Home Office, the list includes 17 prisoners with a combined sentence of 75 years and one life sentence. This includes a combined total of 15.5 years for rape, 16 years for violent offences, almost 29 years for drug-related offences, including Class A drugs, and 14 years for robbery with possession of firearms. The People's National Party has wished Councillor Carrie Douglas well as she decided to switch allegiance to the ruling Jamaica Labour Party. Douglas, councillor in the Kingston and St. Andrew Municipal Corporation and the Trafalgar Division, crossed to the floor on Tuesday. I'd like to formally advise of my intention to cross the political aisle this morning, Your Worship. Yes. I have two letters to inform both yourself and the CEO of the council of this intention. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> In a statement Tuesday, PNP General Secretary Julian Robinson said, quote, the party is already well advanced in confirming its new candidate for the Trafalgar Division and is committed to retaining the seat in the next local government elections, end quote. 
Members of the Revivalist Church and officials paid homage to the late great intuitive artist, bishop, patriarch and founder of the St. Michael's Revival Tabernacle, Malika Kapo Reynolds, this week. Malika Kapo Reynolds, as a self-taught artist, was more popularly known for his paintings, but he was also a sculptor. Kapo's works have been exhibited widely both at home and abroad. He has held exhibitions in New York, Los Angeles, and Washington, D.C., and his works form a part of the permanent collection of the National Gallery of Jamaica. Minister of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport, Olivia Babsey Grange, noted that Kiapo's art now carries great value. He was so artistic, so creative that he produced some of the greatest pieces of art that this country now boasts. According to Minister Grange, Kiapo as a revivalist led the way in preserving the African retentions of our culture with the support of late former Prime Minister Edward Siaga. Those who led the way must always be respected. And that is why today we say we are remembering Kappa Reynolds. And I want to say to the family, I thank you for being here. You make it special. And thank you for carrying on his work. The minister also noted the event's date falls within Black History Month, which is observed in February. And we owe much gratitude for the tremendous impact he has had on our lives through his work. The numerous pieces of art he produced were all unique in some way. He told the story of the African Jamaican from an interesting perspective. He could see the struggles and the fears, but he also saw dignity, joy, and celebration among a people trying to come to terms with post-colonialism. His art reflected his deepest passion, revivalism. One of two Afrocentric religious expressions in Jamaica, the other being Rastafari. During his lifetime, Malaika Kiapo Reynolds was the recipient of many awards in Jamaica, including the Gold Award from Emperor El Selassie during his visit to Jamaica in 1966 and there were many other awards. Kiapo remains one of the island's more enduring cultural icons, leaving a legacy that continues to grow. Reporting for the news on PBCJ, I am Marlon Samuels. February is heart month. You should live your best life, starting with making better food choices. Your heart will thank you for it. In this Living Healthy Report, we get tips from clinical nutritionist, Dr. Susan Sawyers Winter. When you set out to live a heart-healthy life, you should try to eat from all food groups like breads, cereals, rice, pasta, noodles and other grains, vegetables and legumes, fruit, milk, yogurt, cheese or alternatives. You should eat lean meat, fish, poultry, eggs and nuts. It's important for you to know what the food contents are. Um, what are the health benefits? So if something is high salt, low salt, um, what expiration date, if you have any allergies, um, how you can manage your food budget. So what are the cheaper foods to buy based on what the quality of the food is? If you have a special health condition, if you're a diabetic, for instance, or if you have renal failure, you need to maybe monitor what exactly your particular nutrients more closely. Dr. Soares Winter says not all packages are 100% honest about the content of a product. A fruit juice can have more artificial flavoring than the actual fruit displayed on the packaging. 
This is important particularly for calories. So look at the size of the container, size of the serving, and the number of servings per container. For most women, it's recommended that they stick to a daily intake of 1,500 to 2,000 calories. For men, it's between 2,000 to 2,500 calories. The type of fat is what is important. When you eat saturated fats and trans fats, these are what we more term like the solid fats. Um, the fats that tend to clog our arteries, contribute to our high cholesterol. Um, this is what drives a lot of the heart disease. Even diab diabetics are prone to, to, you're prone to becoming diabetic if you have a high fat diet. Diabetes is not just about the sugar or carbohydrate intake. And so you want to look at that and a rough guide is that if, if, if the food has more than 30% of the calories coming from fat, then it's technically a high fat food. So oils would have all 100% calories coming from fat. Something like peanuts, um, you know, roasted Spanish peanuts where it's roasted in oil, they may have 55 to 60% of calories coming from fat. So even though nuts are healthy, having too much of them can have um, ill benefits to them. The next one we need to be concerned about is sodium. Why? Many of us here are either hypertensive. If you have a family risk of hypertension, then you are likely also to have that risk. Um, we have strokes, heart disease, no, sodium is one of those foods that's naturally occurring in most foods. So even fruits and vegetables have some amount of sodium. It's not a nutrient that we can really get completely out of our diet. And it is actually an essential nutrient in that we do need some amount of sodium in our diet. The problem is that in many packaged foods, it's used either as a flavor enhancer or as a preservative. So when you get canned peas and it's stored in brine, Simply rinsing it off can help to remove some of that sodium. Some of us add salt at the table. Okay, so in the same breath, you want to manage the sodium intake. Now, WHO recommends that we should be having less than two grams or 2,000 milligrams of sodium, and that's equivalent to about a teaspoon of salt. Doesn't sound like a lot, but the next time you're seasoning like meats and you're sprinkling not just the salt, some soy sauce, some drug seasoning, some powdered seasoning, it will add up. According to Dr. Soros Winter, a low sodium diet can even reduce frequent migraines. dollar on Tuesday, February 11, and the trading at $142.39, up by 12 cents. Uh, that's according to the Bank of Jamaica's daily exchange trading summary. The Canadian dollar is being traded at $107.84, up from $107.21, while the British pound sterling is being traded at $184.38, up from $183.29. In regional news, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will meet with Caribbean community leaders during their 31st intersessional summit in Barbados next week. The Caribbean-based Secretariat has confirmed that information. It said that Trudeau will meet with leaders of the 15-member regional grouping on the first day of their two-day summit that will be held at the Lloyd Erkstein Sandford Centre on the outskirts of the capital. Trudeau is also scheduled to hold bilateral discussions with CARICOM chairman and host Prime Minister Mia Mutley. Ottawa said that the visit is to allow him to make his pitch to a new audience regarding Canada's bid for a seat on the United Nations Security Council. It said that while Trudeau is expected to talk to Caribbean leaders about climate change, given the region's particular vulnerabilities to its impacts, the Security Council seat will also figure prominently. The visit to the Caribbean follows a week-long visit to Africa and Europe where Trudeau is attempting to lock down votes for a seat at the Security Council table from those countries. 
In Trinidad and Tobago, health services for the central block of the Port of Spain General Hospital has been relocated to the St. James Medical Center. TTT News' Ian Watson tells us more. Once known as the St. James Infirmary, the facility was transformed into the St. James Medical Complex several years ago. With the central block of the Port of Spain General Hospital now deemed uninhabitable and to be reconstructed, the St. James Complex is being utilized in the interim. On Tuesday, the two surgical wards of the central block, ICU, two isolation rooms, operating theater, as well as 69 beds were transferred to St. James. Health Minister Terence Dial Singh was proud to see the building is no longer a haven for pigeons and dust. As a matter of fact, you can film episodes of House and Grey's Anatomy here. Mr. Dial Singh said the $40 million facility is one of a kind. You have a 24-7 A&E, two, cancer treatment, chemotherapy, radiation. Now you have a 69-bed facility for, as a secondary hospital. So there is no other facility in Trinidad and Tobago that offers you this suite of integrated services anywhere in Trinidad and Tobago. The health minister took time to explain the challenges the world is facing in the health system. He said for the past 10 years, the world has had to deal with the resurgence of swine flu, Ebola, chikungunya and Zika. He added some of these viruses are making a comeback. The bubonic plague, which we thought was consigned to the dustbin of medical history is now making a comeback in some parts of the world. So you have to be prepared for that. Right now, there's a small outbreak of bubonic plague. Why? Because a couple decided to eat the raw kidney of a marmoset. Mr. Dial Singh said with the improved transportation modes across the world, viruses can spread quickly, thus increasing the risks. But the people who are charged with oversight of the health sectors in their respective countries, he said, are coping. In sports, we start with football. The Jamaica Football Federation on Tuesday announced the appointment of two new members, financial analyst Dennis Chung and Cavaliers football club coach Rudolph Speed to its board of directors. JFF President Michael Ricketts stated his intention to get ratification for Chung to chair the Finance Committee and speed the Technical and Development Committee. The two additions were unanimously approved by the board at its last sitting on January 29. According to the JFF, in keeping with its Articles of Association, two people can be co-opted to make a maximum total of 19 members, making up the full executive. As per articles, these persons who are non-voting members should have specific roles on the executive. The rest of the executive includes 13 parish presidents and the president and three vice presidents. In cricket, left-handed Windy's stroke maker Shimran Hetmeyer has been included in the Guyana Jaguars squad for their fifth round domestic first class match against Windward Island's Volcanoes, starting in Grenada on Thursday. The details in this newsroom Guyana report. The squad departed Guyana on Monday, but without Hetmeyer, who is expected to travel on Tuesday. It is understood the left-hander had some issues with a particular travel document. Hetmeyer, who was overlooked for West Indies' upcoming ODI series against Sri Lanka for failing to meet the new minimum fitness standard outlined by Cricket West Indies, has replaced wicketkeeper batsman Tevin Imlak in the Jaguars' setup. It is the only change from the squad that lost to Jamaica Scorpions by seven runs in round four at Providence last weekend. Additionally, Hetmeyer was set to undergo a retest on Friday, February 14, but according to a reliable source, that process would now take place next Tuesday, February 18, following his participation in the upcoming game. Hetmeyer's inclusion for this round, according to the source, would allow him to work closely with Jaguars physiotherapist Neil Barry Jr., who is designated to conduct the retest as the batsman looks to get back into contention for the T20 segment of the Sri Lanka series. The Ghana Jaguars squad reads Leon Johnson captain, Vishal Singh, Anthony Bramble, Chandrapal Hemraj, Tejanarain Chandrapal, Christopher Barnwell, Shimron Hetmeyer, Raymond Rifa, Kevin Sinclair, Versami Pramal, Devendra Bishu, Keon Joseph and Nayal Smith. 
Meanwhile, defending champions Ghana Jaguars have slipped to number two on the points table after losing to Scorpions in the fourth round. The five-time champions started the round top of the table, marginally ahead of Barbados Pride, but they have swapped positions after the latest round. This is the Jaguars' second defeat this season to go along with two wins. The Jaguars are now on 49 points after losing to Scorpions in a low-scoring affair, while the Pride have accumulated 65.2 points after beating Leeward Islands Hurricanes by an innings and 81 runs. Trinidad and Tobago Red Force are third and 41.6 after a draw against the Windward Islands Volcanoes, who are fourth on 40.4 points. The victory against the Jaguars has moved Scorpions from bottom of the table to fifth on 36.8 points, while Hurricanes are now at the bottom on 29.2. And that's the news. Thanks so much for watching.